Vitamin D is one of those things that you could talk and just do a, a whole seminar on. Um, so we don't want to do that, but we want to give you the, the clinical pearls, really, that you can learn from today. And I think the most important thing is that you can't say a person has adequate <coughs> vitamin D by testing them with vitamin D. Okay? That will tell you if they're deficient in D, but it will not tell you whether the um, nuclear receptors are being activated by the uh, active forms. So the best way to remember this is that the vitamin D comes from the diet, the 25 is the storage form, and the 125 and the 2425 are the active forms, which have short shelf lives. So, not short shelf lives, short half lives in the blood. So here, to summarize that, and you've got all this on your chart there, you've got the 7 dehydrocholesterol. This is the form of cholesterol which is under the skin, at the fifth layer of skin. So you have to have ultraviolet of a very high frequency or wavelength to penetrate. So this is the UVB, which is always considered the B for bad UV, because it's a shorter wavelength than the UVA, which gives us a nice suntan. Okay? So this is the one we tend to use suntan lotion to protect against. But at the same time, if you don't have that UVB, you don't convert hydroxy, uh, uh, dehydrocholesterol into calci uh, vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol. And the wavelength is 290, given a bit of take. Now, 400 is the end of the visible spectrum. So when you go below 400, you can no longer see the light. Okay? But the light is there, but we can't see it. So in fact, we know that anything beyond 400, smaller than 400, is ultraviolet A, and then at 300 it goes into ultraviolet B. We don't see that, but fish can. Fish have eyes that see into the ultraviolet because they don't have the red end of the spectrum because it goes through the water. So they don't see red. Okay? So they're uh, very fortunate they can see ultraviolet, but they don't see the red world that we do. Okay? And the birds have four cones in their eyes, uh, and they can see more. So some birds are able to track in the infrared zone. Owls are one of those. So an owl can spot a mouse in a field in the darkest night. Not because it can see it, but it can heat seek it. And it drops a urine, a speck of urine, every second or so. So every time that mouse drops a bit of urine, the hawk or the bird, the owl, spots that, follows that trail and, and takes the mouse, just like that. Because it can see effectively into the uh, infrared zone at the other end of the spectrum. But 290 is the one, and that's the one you get from the high sun when it's above 45 degrees. So this is why it has to be in the midday sun. Now, as we talked before, diet is very small. Difficult, unless you eat liver, fish liver particularly, cod liver being better than halibut generally, um, and wild mushrooms, very difficult. It's amazing that people get enough D at all, really, from the diet that they follow, which is probably why they reckon generally 50% of people in this country are deficient in vitamin D the whole year, 50%. 85% of people are deficient in the winter, in the midwinter. So it's, it's a, a real big problem, isn't it? Okay. If 50% of people are deficient the whole year, you know, heaven knows what they're like in the winter. No wonder we have so many ailments associated with vitamin D. So the cholecalciferol goes through the blood to the liver where it's hydroxylated at the 25 position, and it's called 25-hydroxycholecalciferol. It has other names, but this is the easy one to remember. This is stored in the liver, muscle, and fat. All right? So this is the one they measure in the blood. Okay? This is the one that tells you whether you're within normal limits. But they've changed the normal limit. The normal limit was considered to be what showed if you've got rickets, or osteomalacia as the adult form of it. Um, and then they talked, ooh, dangerous, because you give mega doses of vitamin D and you get calcification at the other end of side effects. Now they decided that the best form or the best level of vitamin D is that blood taken from somebody in the midday sun in the middle of summer, in the middle of June. Okay? They've got the 20,000 international units from the sunshine. The body switches that mechanism off and gives them the optimal dose. And that now is considered to be the optimal dose. So when they measure 25 hydroxy in the blood, that's the level they go for now as being optimal, which means most people are deficient. 
Okay? If you use the lower level of rickets to prevent rickets, most people were fine. Okay? Most people haven't got rickets. But most people have got the diseases associated with low levels of vitamin D with the immune system, etc. So 25 hydroxy is then converted to the 125, which is what the books originally said is the activated form. This one principally works on the calcium metabolism. This is what draws the um, calcium out of bones to raise blood calcium levels to normal. It helps you absorb more calcium from the diet, from the gut, and seals the kidney from excreting it. So that's the three ways it normalizes blood, because we have to keep our calcium strictly at the level, uh, otherwise we go one way or the other. So that's the job of the 125. The 2425 is almost like an antagonist. When one goes up, the other one goes down. So they're almost like regulators within the same hormones. So this 2425 hydroxy, which is the alternative one, is converted in the prostate. This one is converted in the kidney, this one. This one is converted in the prostate, the testes, brain, skin, colon, breast, lungs, heart, and immune system. Probably anywhere, but these are the main ones that we find. Okay? So this one converts onto the 2425, which is the immunomodulation. This is the one that helps us with our macrophages and monocytes, and always our immune system. It gives the prevention of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes. Now, I've checked for years all my multiple sclerosis cases, and very few of them show to vitamin D deficiency, because they're all taking it. You know. But none of them are deficient that much in vitamin D. They're all deficient in 2425, which nobody's measured. Because you've never measured 2425 or 125, nor have I. Okay? You're the first people, because we've been able to obtain these markers, you're the first people in the applied kinesiology world to ever have used this. This has never been done before, to realize that vitamin D is not vitamin D, it's the activated forms, on the assumption that everybody activates vitamin D. So do not base your diagnosis that a person is not vitamin D deficient because they don't strengthen to, to vitamin D. This is the one that prevents infections. Okay, so this is very, very important to get this level up to prevent infections. This is the one that regulates cell growth, in other words, in cancer prevention, and maybe even in, you know, alongside cancer maintenance um, for people. It improves mental health. This is mainly by helping stimulate the serotonin pathway. Um, and it's anti-inflammatory, so it reduces pain, particularly bone pain. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Now this slide here just puts in the enzymes that do this. So this first one, from codecalciferol to uh, uh, the 25, is a hydroxylasing enzyme. It's cytochrome uh, 27A1. The conversion through the kidney to the 125 is by cytochrome 27B1. And the one that converts here to the 2425 is CYP24. So they're all cytochrome P450 enzymes. Do you see that? You, you understand the same thing. They're hydroxylating enzymes. Same enzymes, family, which do the detoxification of xenobiotics and a lot of our hormones. Okay? Because this is really a steroid hormone, vitamin D. So, how do we stimulate these enzymes? We give them something which stimulates the liver to produce more of the enzymes. And that's where the black cumin seed comes in. Possibly the piperin or piperin-like substance, which actually stimulates the liver to produce more of the enzymes. Okay? That's where I got the idea from. So we've known that certain spices will stimulate liver detoxification. And how does it do that? It does it by upregulating cytochrome P450. And the first one that they did all the research on was turmeric, because turmeric upregulated phase one and phase two. Okay, so that's it in a sort of a nutshell. So these are all cytochrome P450s. Okay, so this is the picture you've got on your laminate there. So you've got the same thing, skin and diet into the circulation, also from foods that we eat here, uh, converted in the liver to the 25, and then from the 25 uh, to the kidney to the 125, or in other tissues to the 24. And on your chart, you'll see magnesium, 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 and magnesium. So magnesium is a very important part of this hydroxylation pathway. So you need magnesium to get 
D to activate. Okay? So it could be there's magnesium in black cumin seed, and that's what's doing it. You know, there's all sorts of possibilities. You can't isolate with a plant the active ingredient, because there's hosts, there's probably 100, 200 active ingredients in a, in a plant. So it's not really a vitamin, it's more of a hormone, a steroid hormone. Uh, so its main function, and this was another revelation really to me, and this is, uh, its main function is in the regulation of calcium, we know about, magnesium, iron, phosphorus and zinc. So they now discovered that calcium is only part of what it regulates. It regulates magnesium, which is pretty important as well as calcium and uh, works with it, iron, phosphate and zinc. Well, you might add on a few more things in there. This is more acting like a mineral or corticoid. In other words, it's regulating the absorption and the function of a whole range of minerals. No wonder this is important stuff. So these are the different names of what we talked about. We worked through those, the 125 and the... Uh, Calcitrol. Um, sun exposure. So one med or minimum erythrodosis when you get a bit pink is enough sun time to give you a slight pinkishness to the skin. Up to 20,000 occurs within 20, 30 minutes depending on the skin tone. You should not use any sun lotion at that time because obviously if you're using sun lotion or a block you're not going to get the UVB. So sun fact prevention factor, sun prevention factor, 15 blocks 95%, sun um, block 15, uh, 30, and above blocks 99%. So these are very effective blocks, but they take away all the good bits, so you're not going to produce vitamin D, as does, of course, a greenhouse or a, a conservatory. So that takes out the UVB as well. So you can sit in there in your conservatory, but you won't get your vitamin D because the glass takes it out. So you should aim for 20 minutes at a 40% skin exposure per day during the summertime. <laughs> okay, so 21st of September to 21st of March, you're in, um, you know, you're having to rely upon what you've stored. So UVA, so no vitamin D is produced. We don't get the uh, vitamin UVD. Solely reliant upon the summer production. Vitamin D slowly released from fat and stores over the winter. Uh, the half-life is generally considered to be six weeks. So in six weeks after the 21st of September, you've only got half of it. Another six weeks, in other words, three months, you've only got a quarter and so on. So this is why by Christmas, you're getting low. By March, you're really low. So you really need to get out. So the only answer, really, is to top up, you know, ideally about November and January in Antigua. We'll go to Barbados, one of them, and Antigua, have a, have a bit of variety. If you want, you've got to get below a certain latitude, which was considered to be Madrid, but now they reckon in midwinter for us, it's actually um, North Africa. So Tangier, uh, I, I would advise, you know, it's cheap holidays at the moment in West Africa. <laughs> yeah. uh, Marrakesh is very nice, um, you know, in, uh, in, in December. So just a little top up, you know, at the end of autumn is good, before the winter. And then sort of in midwinter is a good idea. You will get some if you go skiing, those of you who like skiing, because you're high up and therefore you're more exposed to the longer periods of daylight. So you will get you the UVB then. Which is one of the reasons why people love skiing, because they say, oh, it's the fresh air and the light is intense. But it's also the vitamin D that you get as a result of it. Difficult to take your top off though. Mm. Uh, darker skinned people need um, I have more melanin, therefore they produce less in that time. So the darker the skin, the more melanin, and the more they block the ultraviolet from coming through. So darker people will need longer. Obese, vitamin D is stored in the adipose tissue, so the more fat you have, the more vitamin D exposure you need to create. And the elderly people, partly because they don't um, uh, expose themselves to the sun enough. So you should take all old people outside and take their clothes off. <laughs> okay, so there's the obese and the older man, elderly. So optimal levels. This depends upon whether we're teaching now in America or over here. So this chart that you've got is on uh, nanomoles per litre. So that level there is in nanomoles, okay? So next week we'll be talking in nanograms to the Americans. So the figures here are two and a half times less. So to get the optimal doses of nano you multiply this by two and a half to get the nanomoles, which is what we use in Europe. 
So less than 25 is deficient. 50 to 80 is considered to be insufficient. 125 to 250 is considered to be optimal. Okay, so these are higher figures to prevent a lot of diseases and illnesses. 45-year-olds across the UK, as we said before, um, have less than 75%. Nearly 90% of subjects are deficient in the winter. 60% of subjects in this study of 45-year-olds were deficient all the year round. Common clinical conditions that we would meet um, every day in our practice is low back pain, diffuse body aches and pains, growing pains, tender bones on palpation, shin pain, depression and fatigue. Susie, how many of those did you, would you tick the box for? <laughs> All of them, yeah. And that's most of our patients, isn't it? Or a lot of us, how we feel and um, <laughs> apart from what? Growing pains. Growing pains, yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, but uh, children do get growing pains. Okay. So even with children, don't base it, they have a vitamin D test done, that everything is fine. It's fine in the blood, as far as the test. But the bottom line really is what is the level of those activated forms on the muscle test. Because the muscle test is really the functional test. It's far more about the body's um, need on the cellular level. How does it cause symptoms? So one of the reasons is that less calcium is absorbed through the gut if you're low in vitamin D. Uh, and this leads to an increase in the parathyroid hormone with the release of calcium from the bone. So to restore normal levels of calcium, you have to mobilize it, okay, and that means coming from the bone. It's unable to mineralize collagen matrix, so you get collagen problems, and hydrates and expands periosteal coverings, which gives you the shin bones and the, and the pain on palpation. Uh, you get an increase in central sensitivity, so the nociceptors, which are your pain tissue inflammation markers, uh, express vitamin D receptors on them. Deficiency leads to hyper of the skeletal muscles, leading to hypersensitivity and pain. Um, Pro-inflammation. So a deficiency is shown to create higher scores on severity pain uh, somatic symptoms. Vitamin D has shown to reduce uh, the high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels. Now this is the one that you've got, the 25. Uh, no, you've got the next one, that one, the nanometers, uh, nanomoles. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Um, so cancers all combined, um, you're coming up in the region here of 100 plus, but they're talking about 100 to 150 to prevent the majority of ailments. Um, so you take breast cancers here, and it gives you a figure in this sort of region. Breast cancer is one of the ones that they've done most studies on. Um, nobody is saying you can treat breast cancer with this. But if you can prevent it, what is a disease but a further stage of the prevention, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You don't catch breast cancer. You develop it because there's predisposing factors to it. And if you can do something with those predisposing factors, then you're more likely for the body to be able to heal itself. Just in the same that we took this morning, if you take the right minerals and you balance the right hormones and you get rid of homocysteine, you're less likely to get osteoporosis later on. Okay, so it makes sense to do something about it on the prevention scale, but if you do have the problems, even if you go down the route of surgery and chemo, etc., you're still going to be deficient in the things that you are deficient in, aren't you? So, you know, it's very important, and most people do want and look desperately for help now, if they do go down and have surgery and chemo, what to do to prevent it. Because I always ask patients who've had surgery, they, what did they tell you was the cause? And they say, well, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, what did they tell you to do to prevent it? And nothing. They come away with no advice. They're t completely lost. Mm -hmm. Then they go on the internet and see all sorts of things, and they don't know what to do. You know, one tells them to eat more vegetables, one tells them to eat less vegetables, one tells them this, one tells them that. One tells them follow a rainbow diet, don't follow a rainbow diet, eat high protein, eat low protein, and so on. They're completely lost with what to do. So this gives you just a, a rough idea, uh, mainly this is off uh, a website, which is, you can see here, multiple sclerosis is right up in this level, so very much higher levels for certain conditions. Um, only the rickets is prevented at the lower levels here. Um, and remember this is the serum levels of 25. Do not base it as 100% that that is the level of the person. <laughs> or that they convert the 25 into the 24, 25, or the 125. 
So we won't go through rickets because uh, osteomyosis is a, just an adult version of that. Um, there used to be a lot about vitamin D levels as toxic. You're up into several hundred thousands for long periods of time to get this. We're talking um, micrograms. So in the days in the 1950s when they were treating rickets, they used to give milligrams or grams of vitamin D. So this is why they got the toxic level. Okay, we now know that the optimal level is what the sunshine gives us and the body switches off when it, when it produces its 20,000 international units. And that's the optimal dose, really, that we should work on. Uh, so high levels will give hypercalcemia, though some might won't. Those are the five types of vitamin D. That's the one we go for, co cholecalciferol. Uh, <laughs> What's that one to do with? It can be made by exposure of skin to ultraviolet. I don't know why that's in there. Biological forms, thermals, dehydrocholesterol. So we talked about conservatories do block the light, the ultraviolet. There's the five layers of skin. So it has to go right down to uh, the uh, spinosum level here and the stratum basal, basal level. This is why you need the uh, ultraviolet t at 290 or below. We talked about sunscreens. Um, we didn't talk about that, you know, some of the bad things, bad chemicals that are in ones. Uh, see here, that's the one that you've got in your, on your chart there. Magnesium, 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 and magnesium. All very important to regulate all these hormones and the conversion pathways. We've talked about the cytochrome P450s involved with the conversions. Um, the vitamin D receptors on the, on the nucleus of the cells uh, have been found in a lot more cells than just bone. We know it's in the kidney and uh, brain and ovaries and prostates. Um, so osteoclasts are the type of cells that absorb bone. They're the ones that um, break bone down. And osteoblasts are the ones that form bone. So we know basically when we're growing up to 25 years of age, we have more osteoblastic activity. When we're 25 to 35, we're even. And at 35 onwards, we're on a slippery path. Okay? So it's at that point our radiation begins to drop down, and we need to build that up with the right bone nutrients. Okay, so that's um, vitamin D affects the immune system, or lack of it because um, uh, vitamin D receptors are expressed in several white blood cells, particularly the monocytes and macrophages, and they also activate the T and the B cells. Vitamin D increases the expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, which goes on to produce L-DOPA and... Um, so it's one of the main reasons for the pathway has roles in the adult diseases associated with malfunctions of this particular vitamin D uh, hedgehog signaling pathway is basal cell carcinoma, which is one of the most common carcinomas on the skin. Has anybody had that? I'm looking for some of you. You've had it. Okay, you'll be the next patient. Because that's the typical case where you probably will not find she's short of vitamin D, but she's short of one of the activated forms. Okay? And therefore, the best thing is, if you see any of those sort of appearing, you need a vitamin D cream fast <laughs> into it, but also you should find that the person will not respond usually to vitamin D unless they've had no sunshine at all. Uh, Herney and Honick contend that you need 4,000 to 12,000 um, units per day, uh, although other people now say it's a little bit more than that. McCullough's suggestion is actually up to 250 as the blood levels here. Allowable health claims, you can claim vitamin D improves the immune system. A normal inflammatory response, it regulates muscle function, reduces the risk of falling, may help prevent osteoporosis and build stronger bones. You'll notice in the bone formula that we talked about the stardust this morning, the bone formula, we don't put vitamin D in it. Why? because that's a dry compound, and you can't use vitamin D in a dry compound. You know, it's a complete and utter waste of time to put vitamin D powder 
into that and pour it down with a glass of water or mix it with water because you simply will not absorb any vitamin D if you put it with water. Okay, does that make sense? Because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. The only way you'll absorb a fat-soluble vitamin is with fat or oil. Okay? So the minimum you've got to do is put it into an oil, a teaspoon with some oil, but it's better to use the oil-based one to begin with. Okay? Is, there's many companies that do this. Many companies already put it in the oil, but they put it in sunflower oil, olive oil, but not the right oil that activates it. Right? And that's the difference. If you don't put it in the right oil, you'll get your vitamin D, no problem at all, but that won't guarantee you can take it to the next stage. So um, diabetes, decreases mortality, bone health, multiple sclerosis, these are all health benefits that you could actually make claims for now. Um, sources we said are very difficult. Oh, this is a source which I found interesting, cocoa husks. That's the bit they throw away from the cocoa bean. Um, great compost, they give it a compost, and they use it as an agricultural feed to supply the vitamin D for cattle. And when I saw that, I realized, if they can supply the vitamin D for cattle, they can, we can have it for humans as well, can't we? So, of course, where does the cocoa bean come from? It comes from the hot places where the D is in there all the time, isn't it? So the, the husk on that, which they throw away because it's no good for the chocolate or anything. Um, whole eggs, you'll get a little bit, but mostly liver compounds for the D3. The activated forms, we know only have a half-life of 15 days. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Well, that one actually, the 125 is generally not a good indicator of vitamin D status because it has a short half-life of 15 hours. And just to finish off there, just a couple of the enzymes that are induced, that tyrosine to L-dopa going on to dopamine. Okay, so this is our neurotransmitter of L-dopa, of dopamine and of noradrenaline. So these are neurotransmitters as well as hormones. And that pathway there, this hydroxylase is stimulated by or induced by vitamin D. Uh, so this one converting cholesterol to pregnenolone, which then goes on to progesterone and aldosterone for the collagen, etc. And this one is induced by vitamin D. And this one is also produced, induced by vitamin E, is the nitric oxide synthase pathway that converts arginine into nitric oxide. Now I'll do briefly about nitric oxide a little bit later.